Okay, um, let's get started. Um, I'm going to just introduce myself briefly. I'll turn it over to Matt, and then we both have some comments. And then we also really want to have this be an opportunity to have a conversation too. I know some of you probably have some questions, but um, we'd really love it to be, you know, informal and really kind of see what's on your mind. Um, but it really excited to be here. First of all, I really want to thank um, Christian and, and new president Brad and uh, all the leadership at Club 20 um, for inviting us to, to participate in this really important forum. Uh, today, I've been involved with, with Club 20 for uh, quite a few years now. Uh, I lived in Gunnison as a kid. I'm a West Sloper, uh, live in Summit County now. And um, I'm the head of the Department of Natural Resources. So it includes uh, quite a few different divisions. I just wanna give you a quick snapshot of everything that entails, but um, we have a water conservation board. They do um, all the kind of water plan grant programs, the, the basin round table meetings. Um, yes, Commissioner Sakata is in the back room <laughs> who represents the South Platte for, for water conservation board. Good to see you, Robert. Um, and uh, Division Water Resources, they handle water administration throughout the state. Parks and wildlife, we have 42 state parks and manage all wildlife in the state that are not endangered or threatened. Um, we have Oil and Gas Conservation Commission. We regulate about 49,000 active wells in Colorado. Um, Division of um, um, Reclamation Mining and Safety, we have seven active coal mines. We have a lot of different aggregate mining and gold mining and so forth. So we regulate all the extractive industries. Uh, state Land Board, uh, we managed 2.8 million acres and last year brought in $177 million for K through 12 education. And then Colorado Avalanche Information Center. So for those that love backcountry skiing or snowmobile uh, enthusiasts, we try to provide the best uh, available information on you know, snow safety around the state. And then last but not least is, is a great tie into Matt is we have a division of forestry but that's all run through the Colorado State Forest Service. Um, so that's kind of a snapshot of you know, what we do in the Department of Natural Resources. So kind of everything the state to do is land, water, wildlife, minerals, and oil and gas. Uh, next, I'll turn it over to Matt. Thanks, Dan. So again, my name is Matt McCombs and I'm the State Forester and Director of the Colorado State Forest Service. Uh, we're a service and outreach organization uh, housed in the Warner College of Natural Resources at Colorado State University. Uh, we also provide staffing and technical support to the Division of Forestry and, and DNR. And uh, we're really looking forward to having this conversation around flipping the paradigm, um, thinking of forest management as a tool, acknowledging that uh, you know, there are very uh, large, very uh, opinions about, uh, about how forest management is laid out on the ground and what the, the benefits and, and drawbacks are. So, the way we're going to run this is, is Dan has a brief presentation, then I have a few remarks, and then, yeah, our, our goal is really to have more of a dialogue uh, than, than a presentation from us. Um, so go, go ahead, yeah, Director Dean. Great. Thanks, Matt. Um, you know, first of all, just thinking of the paradigm shift, um, I, I think there's one thing that we need to be aware of, too, is, is you know, when you have certain catastrophic events, uh, people start thinking a little bit differently, I would say, about forest health um, and proactive management. And I'll just kind of share with you what I think over the last few years have been, you know, big time events that have kind of changed this paradigm. Uh, number, th number one, you know, we had the three largest wildfires in Colorado history um, happen um, in 2020. Um, and then on top of that, um, just last year um, with a Marshall fire that burned over a thousand homes, um, we have the average warmer temperatures right now than the 1930s Dust Bowl era. Um, we have snowpack that's average right now. You know, Colorado River is about 99%. Gunnison Basin's 114% right now, your old neck of the woods. Um, but it's very much kind of an average year. But here's the kicker. The snow moisture content um, for moisture within the ground is 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 very different it's it's way off you have to dig down you know six inches eight inches in certain spots to find that same moisture content that we used to have you know just a few years ago so that really has an impact on on flows um and then here's um really an important component you know we're seeing more and more people move to, to colorado um some of the more recent figures reflected, there was a time it was like 50 to 60,000 new people, believe it or not, moving to the state a year. 
And the most recent figures reflect that we have right now about one in two Coloradans that live within the wildland urban interface. So where your home is adjacent, you know, to forested or grassland areas that, you know, could have a high susceptibility of, of wildfire behavior. Um, so I think those, you know, areas um, are definitely kind of uh, creates a new um, kind of interest, I would say, to say the least, in, in Colorado. Um, for me personally, um, just thinking of um, this paradigm shift that, that we're looking at, um, looking at defensible space and forest health issues is something that's really near and dear to my heart. Um, I live in Summit County. Uh, it's a community that we've seen some, some wildfire activity. Um, and we're really um, a community that I think has really come together uh, in terms of um, let's, let's bring everyone to the table. Let's figure out how we can um, do some meaningful projects that will protect lives, property, and critical infrastructure. Um, I'm a former legislator. I used to serve in the House and Senate, and my um, the salary was so lousy back then. It's, it's still kind of lousy, but my side job was Summit County's wildfire mitigation specialist. So I'd go like literally door to door at times, you know, working to make recommendations on defensible space. Um, Deborah, I've been to your house helping you out <laughs> at one point. <laughs> Hopefully, I did a good job at your house. <laughs> um, but, but literally, you know, folks would call up the, the local fire department and so forth, and I would, you know, work with with the department to to make recommendations. Um, and then, you know, I, I rattle off all those different topics that the Department of Natural Resources has right now, and I really just wanted to like share with you that's a long list of areas that we cover: land, water, wildlife, minerals, oil, and gas. But to tell you the truth, the forestry stuff is really near and dear to my heart, to say the least. I just um, really have a, have a great passion. I really appreciate Matt's leadership you know, at the State Forest Service now. Um, let me just look at, um, I have a few slides I wanna share with you all. See if this, oh yeah, you wanna, that's great. Um, it's, the, it's the one next to the arrow. Okay, yeah, so um, you can see, Oh, that's weird. Can you click one more? I want to show. Okay, maybe go back. Yeah. Okay, so this 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 slide shows, you know, Boulder County almost 100 years apart. So you can see um, on the bottom left, um, you know, the density of the forest was not, you know, similar to what it is, you know, right now. Um, in Colorado, we've done, you know, a really good job of suppressing fires, as I mentioned. You know, we have one in two Coloradans that live within the wildland urban interface. There's an the expectation that local fire departments are going to get out there um, as, along with the state. It's great to have Sam and, and Ryan here with us, too, the Division of Fire Prevention Control. They do an amazing job of working with local communities, too. Um, but, but, you know, if we don't have the suppression, then, you know, trees will, will eventually die of, you know, a drought, disease, you know, sometimes wildfires. Um, and obviously we can't harvest everything, but, um, but there's definitely landscapes, oh, it looks a lot better, um, you know, that, that we can focus on. Let's go to the next um, slide. Oh, yeah, I think, I think that's all right, yeah. Um, so we've, we've seen, you know, in the news, obviously, um, wildfire, smoke, uh, post-fire flooding, debris flows, um, impacts uh, communities big time. Um, I was on uh, both the Grizzly Creek fire last or a couple of summers ago and the Cameron Peak fire. And um, pretty amazing when you look at, you know, what those impacts have, uh, not only on water quality and quantity, but when you think of the Grizzly Creek fire, um, you know, the rafting industry, for example, is a multi-million dollar industry that was literally shut down, you know, for a big part of the summer as a result of that particular fire. Um, we all, there was also a study that was conducted on I-70, um, and this was done back in, I wanna say 2005 or 26, that reflected that every hour the I-70 mountain corridor shuts down equals about a million dollars of lost revenue. So, um, so this really impacts you know, local economies, you know, big time to say the least. Um, and let's go to the next slide. Okay, so, you know, when we look at our um, plan of, of, you know, how we're working to, to move a paradigm shift and so forth, you know, I think it's important for everyone to recognize, and, and Matt and, and Frank Bem earlier today uh, discussed the, the shared stewardship MOU that is really, a, it's really the state and the U.S. Forest Service 
um, laying out a plan on how we work together. And it's not just on forestry issues, but it's how we work together on trails, how we work together on um, the growth that I mentioned the state's occurring, how we deal with like, you know, parking issues and, and really working together. But this 2019 framework, you know, really helps um, make sure that, that we're on the same page, the state of Colorado and the US Forest Service on looking at the right pace uh, the right location and the right scale. And I can't stress those three words enough. You know, the, the pace, location, and scale is so important when we think about kind of paradigm shifts in, in working on forest health issues. The, the US Forest, is anyone here with the US Forest Service? I know Dan is. Um, but, you know, there's, and Frank's in the back room. But, you know, there used to be kind of like almost a saying that, you know, hey, we're going to get some projects done. And, and it was like almost like the random acts of restoration, you know, like, hey, we have quotas from Washington, D.C., and we need to make sure that we're fitting the quotas. But, you know, is it the right location? Is it the right, you know, pace? Um, are local communities, you know, uh, supportive of that as well? And it's been kind of a mixed bag, but I, I really appreciate um, the shared stewardship uh, MOU that we have now that really spells out exactly, you know, how we work together and collaborate, which, which at the end of the day, I think minimizes the threat of, of lawsuits as well, um, which I think is, is important as well. Let's go to the next slide here. So this is a photo too of... Um, of, of a photo actually in Summit County in the Peak 7 neighborhood um, in, in the Breckenridge area. Um, it was, the photo was taken from the State Forest Service 2021 Forest Action uh, Report that, that really you know, highlights this really important fuels break. And in Summit County, um, thinking of kind of paradigm shifts, like I remember so vividly you know, years ago, um, when, um, I don't know if Nancy Fishering is in the room here, but there'd be like, you know, Nancy Fishering and like Carl Spaulding. Carl, Carl you know, as a participant with Club 20 in the past, but he's a former um, head of the Colorado timber industry, sit next to Karn Stiglmeyer, who used to be a Summit County commissioner, but at that time was the head of the Sierra Club for, for the region. And I can't tell you um, how important having a local forest health collaborative uh, was in Summit County to get projects off the ground to kind of almost switch a paradigm, if you will, of, of you know, not looking at, you know, the, the timber industry and trucks that come through as, as oh, you know, they're anti-environmentalists or they're, they're here to, you know, take down all the trees or whatever, but really focus on, hey, they're here to work with our community. We know we live in a community that's, that's prone to wildfires and they're gonna play a really important role in helping to protect lives, property, and critical infrastructure. We know how much money, you know, Denver Water, Aurora Water, Colorado Springs Utilities, all the biggies have put, you know, in terms of, you know, uh, defensible space, but also, you know, watershed restoration, because they know that when we do have fires, that it's a big deal to their system. Um, the Cameron Peak fire costs about $130 million to fight. You know, the Cameron Peak fire alone um, after is, is over $100 million and counting in terms of the restoration that's really needed to move forward. You know, it costs about um, $1,200 or so to do, you know, um, thinning projects, um, proactive forest management on the front end. And that's just kind of an average. You know, when you bring in, I'm looking at my fire friends in the back room, you know, Sam and Ryan, you bring in type one heavies, you know, cranes, you know, that's easily a million dollars a day, you know, for, for big fires. But the estimate I've heard, and actually Dan Dallas would probably know this the best, but, you know, it's, um, I believe about, you know, 50 to 60 to $70,000 um, easily uh, an acre to treat, you know, if you bring in all the heavies in. And so, you know, fighting fires is really important and we need all those resources, but I can't stress the importance to put, you know, the, the work on the front end. Uh, the DNR is involved with the front end before fires and then after fires. We're not involved, you know, during the fires. But um, anyways, let me just turn it over to, to Matt now. But, you know, really quick, just a few takeaways. Um, you know, forest health collaboratives, in my opinion, work. Uh, it, it really minimizes, you know, potential, you know, lawsuits and making sure that you can kind of grease the wheels to get projects off the ground. 
Um, everyone, all the different players and communities need to have a seat at the table. Um, you know, I think we need to have forest, forest management that looks through a lens similar to what we're trying to do with, I would say kind of fire in general, is a look through a lens of pretending in Colorado, there's no difference between federal, state, private, or tribal lands, that we all work together. And it's kind of like, you know, hey, let's, it doesn't matter if this boundary stops and that boundary stops. Um, I worked on a prescribed fire in Vail last uh, spring uh, with the Vail fire, fire Department. And literally, like, it was, it was great. It was all along the kind of East Vail hillside. Some of you have probably went, went by at that time. But I was asking Vail Fire, you know, why can't we go a little bit farther that way? Well, that's U.S. Forest Service land. We can't do it right there, you know. But like, hey, we had the right team out there to do that. But does that really make sense? So let's all work together. And the Shared Stewardship MOU, in my opinion, is that great connector with the State Forest Service with Matt, with Frank Mem. Uh, we're also, the state's also having conversations with the Bureau of Land Management so that we can also just like, again, not look at these silos, but all work together uh, to make sure we get the right place, right location, right scale, and all be on the same page will we'll help create this change of paradigm that I think we're all looking for. So with that, let me just turn it over to, to Matt. Thanks, Dan. Uh, you know, I just want to do a little bit of framing before we get into the dialogue. And you know, having worked in, in at the implementation level across this country, you know, my first job with the U.S. Forest Service was on the Olympic National Forest in the Pacific Northwest. It was the epicenter of the beginning uh, of sort of what has been colloquially known internally and, and as well as externally in the U.S. Forest Service is the timber wars. And I remember my first district ranger telling me that don't go into that bar. Don't go into that restaurant and don't use that gas station, especially if you're in uniform. And, it, and that was the, my, my first introduction, really, as a land management professional into this, this space where, um, where forest management exists with, with a lot of tension, acknowledging that there's just a variety of perspectives on the art and science of, of, uh, of forestry. And even though uh, the, the United States has a remarkable, and states all across the country have a remarkable history of applying forest management in sensible ways that have allowed us to persist uh, for, for generations, the unique uh, ecosystem benefits, quality of life benefits, and, and scenic benefits that, that come from a well-managed forest. We have examples of where um, you know, forestry was practiced unsustainably in, in the late 19th century. And it was the origin story of the U.S. Forest Service. Uh, a lot of people don't realize that the, uh, the um, architect, uh, you know, the, the founder, really the first chief of the U.S. Forest Service, uh, Gifford Pinchot, that his family uh, made their fortune by denuding the Poconos, essentially, like, you know, raping and pillaging the land and leaving it uh, uh, in, in a state of complete disrepair and, 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 and completely um, undermined economic function. And yet he went over to Germany and then came back uh, and it began experimenting uh, with this new modern approach to forest management and, and essentially established the cradle of forestry in America, which is in North Carolina, which was a place I got to work for about four and a half years as well. And in, in each iteration in, in my career uh, as a land manager, I continued to sort of expose my, uh, get, get exposed to the history and as well as the challenges associated with forestry uh, in the United States. And certainly, and we, we, we come here uh, to Colorado we still, we have to acknowledge that that tension exists. And one of the things uh, that I've been very focused on throughout my career is flipping this paradigm and trying to face down that tension and those challenges um, in a way that's, that's going to transform the way that people look at log trucks rolling down the road. You know, my, my aspiration, frankly, my, my, my dream is that every single time uh, and a successful forest management action takes place in this state, and those and those trucks are rolling to the mill, generating economic benefits for communities um, and sustaining the unique uh, affiliation that this country and this state has with the practice of forestry. That they also see habitat renewal, they also see watershed health improvement, and that folks see um, resilience to climate change and the pressures of of, uh, of a growing population. I think the most important thing that we can do is, it, much to the way that uh, Dan was describing, is we've got to go meet people where they are. You know, those collaborative settings, that, that collaborative management model, which really is, is, I would say, in the last four, five, ten years, has come into a, a state of fruition where, where everybody kind of understands and embraces stakeholder-driven solution building and, st uh, and then also embraces um, stakeholder-driven and collaborative implementation. You know, that, 
that, in my experience, again, if you can go to people where they are, where their values lie, where their perspectives are shaped and, and create uh, an environment where we can tease out the tension associated with the legacy of logging and forest management in this country and in this state, we have a huge opportunity to activate in people's minds um, the uniqueness and, and the incredible efficacy and impact of this amazing tool, which is the, 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 the elegant, in my mind, frankly, this, this beautiful, elegant art and science of growing forests uh, into a healthy state that, that allows them to provide the unique benefits that they do uh, to the people and as well as um, our wild neighbors. And, and I think that, uh, I hope that this conversation starts to tease out opportunities where we can continue to lean into that tension and, and acknowledge that we all come from, from different places in our experiences and, and in the places uh, where we work and, and the individuals that we interact with. But we can all agree that uh, we want healthier, more resilient forests in the face of climate change and rapidly growing populations, that we have a, a duty, a responsibility, a moral imperative to ensure that the water continues to flow uh, and, and, that, and that we have the resources that we need for a continually growing nation and that we don't outsource the impacts to other countries, to other places uh, where, where uh, there is less regulation and less environmental review. You know, we, we, we uh, import um, billions of dollars of timber from all across the planet. Uh, in, in places where it's harvested in unsustainable ways, in places where um, we don't have the same influence over the impacts associated with the incredibly important uh, resource that is, that is wood fiber in our economy. So, and I just want, one more thing I just want to kind of put into the room as we continue to think about how do we flip the paradigm associated with the legacy and the, and the inherent tensions of forest management in this country. And I'll speak to a hearing that was held last week, and it's only because I think it's fascinating because of the the voice that's in the room. It's a beautiful voice. It's a world-renowned voice, and it's the voice of Carol King, the singer, right? Um, and she was on the Hill last week testifying about the infrastructure bill and, and used a terminology that I'd never heard before as it relates to how people describe and think of forest management in this country. And um, I got to tell you, I got a little fired up. I had a little bit of umbrage after this, and I no longer work for the U.S. Forest Service, but by God, I sure love the U.S. Forest Service and the work that they do on behalf of the American people. Uh, and the term that, that came out of a bunch of articles in, in this discussion was the, our tendency to use Orwellian euphemisms to describe forest management in this country, vegetation management, forest management, uh, restoring resiliency, restoration, Orwellian euphemisms. What that six signals to me is number one, that they're questioning the integrity of, of my colleagues and the, and the integrity of the foresters in this country. And as your state forester, I believe you pay me to take umbrage with those statements because um, I'm proud of the forest legacy in this state and I'm proud of the forestry legacy in this country. And, I, and it, it signals to me that we have work to do as it relates to the, fulfilling this dream that I have of how people see forest management uh, in the state. But it also calls into question, are we being successful in the words that we use? Are we being su in successful in describing the remarkable impacts that we can achieve with this remarkable tool that we've been cultivating and growing uh, in, its, in its scientific relevance and groundedness, uh, as well as its efficacy in, in the field as it relates to the new technologies that we have available to deploy? So we have work to do, and I look forward to the conversation about what is that unique work that, that Club 20 and in community leaders across the state can have in demystifying and destigmatizing in ways uh, that, that people still cling to. And I, you know, if you work for the US Forest Service long enough, you come in contact with this concept of the Lorax effect, right? This idea that when anyone sees a tree come down, all they can think of is the thwacker, right? And, the, and this, this hungry animal, this beast trying to, to rob and, and pillage. And I think that that that, uh, that still obviously exists if, if we can still see in the narratives uh, going up in, uh, with people that have very important roles as, uh, as, as you know, as, <laughs> I have no idea how famous Carol King is anymore, but I do know that most people know who she is and, and that her, she's pretty famous. She's got a fabulous voice and, uh, and, and a long relationship really with the U.S. Forest Service. And, and the idea that this is sort of where we're at uh, causes me some concern and suggests that we have some work to do as it relates to what it is that we're trying to achieve for the forest. We are so uh, remarkably uh, humbled and honored to manage on behalf of both the state of Colorado, but of course, beyond that, the American people, because I don't see those boundaries either. 
I, I see these forests are Colorado's forests, regardless of the jurisdiction. And we all have a responsibility as Colorado's leaders to manage them effectively. And that requires using forest management uh, as, as a tool in, the, in that toolbox. So I look forward to that conversation. I just want to sort of tee up and then make sure that we're going to embrace and engage that tension associated with the legacy of logging in this country and in this state and, and have some really interesting conversations around how do we move forward uh, in a way that allows the people of Colorado in particular to see this remarkable uh, practice, the rem this remarkable science uh, that, my, that my foresters practice on a daily basis, basis in, in, the, in the consulting foresters and the foresters in the US Forest Service and across all the different agencies that employ those remarkably capable people that have a deep and abiding love for trees. Uh, how we can honor them in a way that, that allows us to take, take things to the next level, have the impacts that we know are necessary to deliver clean water, to provide a reliable flow of timber, and to provide uh, the remarkable recreation economy that drives in many ways uh, the economy of this state. Uh, and, and most importantly, I think, um, continue to provide uh, homes for, for our wild neighbors. I think these are, these are the things I, I hope we get into uh, this afternoon. And um, I look forward to the first question. Okay, we've got about 15 minutes uh, for questions. I would encourage everybody that wants to ask questions to keep them short and to the point so that we can get around the room. So Deborah is up and then we'll just follow the. Hi, I'm Deborah Irvin uh, from Breckenridge and I'm proud to be on the board of directors for Club 20. Um, uh, I have been voicing this frustration for many years and so I'm hoping that you will listen, Matt, uh, no pressure. But to get a little background, I live at about 11,000 feet uh, on two and a half acres and I've been there for 18 years full time. We are, my community is, has, um, we're part of the designated Firewise community, very few in Summit County. And we're very proud of that every year. Last year I had 14 piles that I gathered up as a widow uh, for the chipping program. And this year I'm gonna be concentrating on juniper. Our frustration is um, we keep talking about collaboration, but in Summit County, we have about 31,000 uh, residents. On any given powerful weekend, we can have over 200,000 people. And there, are, and so we have a majority of tourists. There was, when we had the Peak 2 fire in 2017, there was a fire half a mile behind my house on, that was an illegal um, abandoned campfire that by trespassers on basically on Bald Mountain. And that year I spoke with uh, one of the deputies and they said there were over 80 um, abandoned wildfire uh, campfires that they found. So there were plenty that were, were, went undiscovered. Last, um, in summer of last year, a friend of mine approached me in, at the post office and he said, Deborah, I just wanted you to know, friends of ours, they were up on Bald Mountain, they were looking down. This was during a period where you couldn't even smoke outside. And he said they counted over 40 campfires down below, which were, so they were technically above my house. The attitude that I've gotten from a lot of legislators and some um, local officials is when I talked to them, I said, look, we have got to start talking to these tourists and telling them that they have a responsibility. And the answer that I have gotten is we do not want to offend the tourists. And of course, my response is, wait, what? And, that, and that's where we've stayed. And I have been doing this for years and complaining. So, you know, again, no pressure. Um, but how can we get to a program that is not a, a literally two inches by one inch that's in the tourism manual that they give people that says you need to put out fires. If you have a campfire, put it out with water. I will tell you that in Bald Mountain, not everybody's drinking water up there and what they're putting on fires, I would not want to put on fires. So what can we do to talk about collaboration? We have got to hold tourists responsible and then accountable for what's going on. We have to take a drone to go flying around and some 35 year old in their mother's basement can be flying this thing to tell us and give us coordinates where we have campfires going on. I know it was too long, but thank you so much. I look forward to that much. program. Uh, 
I want to deploy the basement uh, squadron for fire mitigation. So real quick on that one. So man, what a, so one of my favorite things to do is fire patrol, right? When I was a district ranger on the, in the districts I worked across, uh, across the country, when we're in higher fire danger, everyone goes to task and goes out and, and does everything they can to reach as many people as they can to, to deliver that message in a one-on-one -on -one basis. And it was remarkable, you know, how many folks uh, don't see that as a, as a, as a concern. And, and, you know, Dan could tell you how many uh, Dallas, our, our, our resident uh, incident commander here today um, could tell us specifically how many fires he has worked in, in his career that were human uh, started. So one thing that I would offer is that, you know, we take um, every opportunity that we can as an outreach agency to reach folks um, with as much messaging and as and much, uh, you know, promotional material as we can around using fire safely. The U.S. Forest Service has an enormous campaign associated with, you know, Smokey Bear and a variety of other um, you know, mascots and, 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 and outreach campaigns. But I'll tell you one good indicator of that the, the, the legislators are listening is that there's a bill in the, in the legislature right now that's designed to significantly amplify Wildfire Awareness Month in May every year. The, the state signed on and, and has ramped up its education every single year. I got to give all credit to Governor Polis and, and for Director Gibbs to, to foot stomping and, and providing backing uh, to that message in, in creating as many opportunities as we can to get it out. And, and if this bill passed, the Colorado State Forest Service will have a significant investment like we haven't really seen before that's specifically to design to ensure that folks are not only aware of how to uh, create defensible space, how to harden their homes, how to be part of the solution as it relates to, uh, to uh, creating every opportunity for, the, for their communities to remain safe in the face of wildfire, but also using fire, uh, both for you know, recreational purposes and otherwise, um, in a safe and, 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 and effective way where they're taking the personal responsibility associated with, uh, with using fire on the landscape uh, for recreational purposes. Uh, but as far as, you know, it's, it's an extremely challenging um, issue, especially with visitors, because they kind of have a, uh, well, that was fun. I'm packing up and now I'm leaving uh, approach to things. And whatever happens after I've left uh, is really not my problem. Creating that buy-in um, is, is a thing that I think community by community, if you can make that a community value, I used to say like in the Gunnison Basin, let's make them understand this is what the cool kids do, right? You wanna be cool like us here in Gunnison, Crested Butte, then put your fire out when you're done and, and be part of the solution, not part of the problem. But there are some good indicators that the legislature's hearing your concerns and interested in amplifying our message uh, that we carry on every single year. Um, and so I'm hopeful that that, that that bill will pass and we'll be able to foot stomp in ways that we haven't in the past and amplify in ways we haven't in the past, wildfire awareness uh, and, and helping every individual resident and visitor um, learn how to play their part. And I'll just add, I, I share your, your frustration and concerns because, you know, you remember after the peak two fire, uh, literally I heard from red, white, and blue, um, like, hey, there's 15 other, you know, unattended campfires going on at the same time while we had stage two fire restrictions in the county. So that means like, no, no, nothing flammable, you know, should be going on. I, I think, I think the state, frankly, I, I think it's a combination of like, um, everything from like, you know, chambers of commerce coming together, the governor, the governments, the county and the municipalities. Um, and, and also, you know, as you know, in Summit County, they're having a lot of discussions on, you know, enhanced like short term rental um, regulations and so forth. You, you could make it a requirement that, you know, uh, you know, because short term rentals are kind of like a hotel, right? You know, you, you make sure there's information on the front end, like, hey, make sure you follow local fire uh, ordinances, you know, and, and if you don't, these are the penalties. I also think CDOT can, can play more of an important role too with their, all their variable message signs, all the people that come up to resort areas and not just say, you know, whatever, Clear Creek and, or Jefferson, Clear Creek and Summit and Eagle or whatever are stage one fire restrictions. Like no one knows what that means, you know, but, but say, you know, fire ban and then whatever X amount of money penalties, you know, to make sure people know on the front end um, that this is serious um, and it's just uh, not, not something that we should tolerate at all. So, but I share your concerns 100%. Uh, good afternoon, I'm Molly Pitts and I serve as the executive director for the Colorado Timber Industry Association. And I have more of a comment than a question. 
but I participate um, in the best management practices audit team. And it's something that happens every two years. We visit state, federal, and private lands. And our audits show that we're doing really good work on the ground. But it, nobody besides me and some other state forest service people know what that is. And I, I think that message needs to get out. Um, I think that's one of the biggest concerns with public is that we're out raping and pillaging and um, we do really good work on the ground. And so I would really like you guys to help get that message out. We do it to protect water quality. Um, and it shows, you can go back the last 12 years, I think now, and show that we are doing really good work. And it doesn't matter what um, boundary, you know, whether it's state, private or federal, the work we are doing out there is really good. And so I think that would be a good thing to get out to the public more. Thanks, Molly. Uh, Dan and Matt, thank you for being here and thank you for your expertise. My name is Lewis Meyer and currently I'm a rancher farmer uh, in Southwest Colorado in Montezuma County and La Plata County. Uh, prior to that, um, I was a water engineer for 40 years, founder of Schmieser Gordon Meyer SGM Inc. Um, the last six years on our ranch uh, has been uh, apocalyptic to say the least. Um, fires on all sides of us, um, heavy thick smoke to the point you can't even be outside safely in the summertime. Um, high winds, which by the way, I think is something that needs to be considered. Um, in 2021, Montezuma County had no water, no irrigation water. The large federal project, Jackson Reservoir, zero water for agricultural irrigation. Smaller reservoirs, zero water. My question is, uh, earlier today in the presentations, there was a statement made multiple times about let's follow the best science. What is, what is the science informing us? Uh, and then proceeded to be a lot of conversation about fuels mitigation, uh, fuel reduction. Later on, we had a discussion about climate resiliency. The question I have is what are your experts telling you about what is driving these fires? Uh, because the engineer, the scientist in me would like to know uh, the solutions we bring form, forward need to be informed by the science and what percentage is driving these issues. Uh, uh, thank you. Yeah, sure. So, um, you know, one of the benefits of being uh, nested at the Colorado State University is that we have access to the entirety of, of the research body, not only uh, housed within the university, but the co-located Rocky Mountain Research Station as well, which is an, uh, uh, part of the U.S. Forest Service. And so there are a variety of factors that are, that are driving sort of large wildfires across Colorado. And the, the, I don't know if the, I can't speak specifically the percentages, but um, the, I try to keep things relatively simple when we, when we try to explain these to, to, to citizens across the state. Number one is the number one thing that's driving uh, wildfires is the absence of wildfire. And, and it, it, you know, Dan showed a picture at the very beginning of his presentation that showed what a healthy forest looked like. And a healthy forest is a patchy forest with multiple different age classes represented, multiple different species represented, um, and, and is consistently exposed to disturbances that create a patchwork, of, a patchwork landscape it allows fires to move through at low intensity. And um, right now we have a whole, we have a state that's, that needs to be desensitized to this idea that a unbroken forest of single, uh, in single age, uh, uh, in single species trees is a healthy forest. And that we have to help folks understand that um, a wealth of data and a wealth of scientific research demonstrates that a healthy forest is uh, what I just described uh, before. And that, and that one of the best ways for us to move uh, our forest back into that, to that uh, condition is forest management. 
and probably the most, uh, but, but the most efficient tool and the, and the least, well, potentially the least cost tool is to before, uh, restore fire to those landscapes. And one of the things that uh, I'm super focused on is as we move out with these sub substantial investments across uh, both the state and, and federal levels is um, focusing on securing communities first and focusing on securing infrastructure first, prioritizing uh, where that uh, values at risk, those, those specific uh, pieces of infrastructure, uh, people's homes, uh, transmission lines, uh, uh, water transmission infrastructure, you know, what, whatever the value is that we've been identified, is that that's where we put our money and our time first, because that creates an opportunity for the U.S. Forest and other fire uh, managers that when fires start uh, in the backcountry uh, through natural ignition, gives us an opportunity to kind of contemplate um, managing them in different ways, allowing them in the right conditions to help us restore that patchy network, that broken network of different age classes, different species uh, that allows for fire to restore itself in, in the natural role. The science is telling us that that is the, that is the outcome. If you wanna think about um, what you want things to look like going forward, uh, again, if you're, that's, that's what it should look like, a, a broken multi-age class forest with a, a variety of species that allows fire when it presents to move through in a way that's not catastrophic, but um, ecologically supportive and, and ecologically affirming. And so, um, there is a robust body uh, of, of research and science that suggests this is the path that we should be taking, and that ecosystem-driven forestry is, is the, one of the key mechanisms uh, to achieve those outcomes in that, in that future. I think we got time for one quick question. I've already told we were almost out of time. Great. Thank you. I'm April Long. I um, work in the Roaring Fork Watershed. I really appreciate your comment because I was asked, was hoping to ask a question about this paradigm shift um, where we have seen um, forest, forestation or deforestation happen so badly for so many years and, and lots of um, naysayers can point to examples of how it's been done so poorly. And it would be great to have examples of how it's been done well um, because I think the fear is that the consequence of not doing it well is so takes so long to recover from. Um, and so I'm happy to hear that. And I'm just going to switch up my que question really quickly to, um, do you have any numbers or, or can point to anything about the greenhouse gas emissions from a prescribed burn versus the logging of that same forested, forested area? Um, so for those that are concerned about that carbon emission, Yes, yeah, so carbon accounting, mm -hmm. a evolving science. And, you know, so even right now uh, in, in, this, in this session, you know, we're in, in conversations with legislators with an intense focus. We, we're in conversations with partners uh, in TNC and elsewhere that are very interested in how are we going to effectively quantify uh, these trade-offs in, in, in the treatments and the approaches that we take? And how are we going to be accountable to this, uh, to the knowledge uh, th that we all now share about uh, what's driving our warming climate. And so we're not there yet. And, and, but the good news is that literally w uh, about three weeks ago, we engaged in some dialogue uh, with the Colorado Forest Restoration Institute, CFRI at CSU, to commission an, um, uh, a study through uh, a coalition of masters and doctoral students, as well as supported by CFRI, to begin to develop that accounting framework that's going to allow us to quantify the carbon release and the carbon capture associated with forest management so that we can be uh, transparent and responsive to the, to the very real and, uh, and legitimate concerns that folks have as it relates to the trade-off associated with management versus, um, versus uh, either prescribed or, or wildland fire. So we're, it's a work in progress. We don't have the data yet. But the good thing is that we're moving in that direction right now. And there's even uh, some discussions, again, in the legislature to significantly increase the capacity within the state forest service to, uh, to be able to have a um, accessible, what, I'm, what I mean by accessible, like you don't have to have a PhD to understand, accessible body of knowledge and science that we can share with the people of Colorado to continue to build the confidence and the faith that they have in the activities that we conduct on their behalf. So feel free to support that endeavor any way you'd like. Okay, we're giving them again, please. Let's...
Well, I know there was other questions in the room and I'm sorry you didn't have time to ask them, but you guys will be around for a while and maybe you, you could approach We could do them. it at the reception. At the reception. With a glass in hand. All right, glass in hand. All right, thank you.